and welcome to the Firm Foundation Series. My name is Pastor Dale Yancey. Today we're on lesson number 18, which is God gave Isaac to Abraham and Sarah, and God delivered Isaac from death. Today we're going to look at a promise that God made to Abraham. It's the promise of a son, and the promise to Abraham is so grossly ignored by so much of Christianity today. And here God does the impossible. In fact, you might call it the Isaac factor. And what we're going to read and talk about today it's the foundation for the gospel. It's the foundation for the good news. If you want to have an understanding of God's purpose here on earth with mankind and also in bringing Jesus Christ to the earth, then everything operates upon the axis of this promise that God makes to Abraham. You see, the promise to Abraham was also made by God to the fathers of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it constitutes the second of three great promises that God made. And even though Abraham and Sarah are so old, they're too old to have children, God still promised to give them a son. But before we continue any further, let's look at last week's lesson on Sodom and Gomorrah, okay? Lesson number 17. And question number one, what did God tell Abraham after Lot left him? Well, A, God told Abraham that he would give him all the land of Canaan. B, God promised that Abraham's descendants would number more than the stars. C, God said that Abraham's descendants would go to live in another country, that they would be ill-treated for 400 years. But after that time, God would bring them back to the land of Canaan, which God had promised to Abraham. Two, what new names did God give to Abraham and Sarai? He gave them the names Abraham and Sarah. Three, and why couldn't Abraham and Sarah have a child unless God performed a miracle? The answer is A, Sarah was unable to have a child. And B, they were both too old. I mean, at this point, Abraham's pretty much close to being 100 years old, and Sarah's 90 years old. Four, who created the first man and woman, and who is it that gives life to every baby? God. Five, is there anything which God wants to do but can't? No. God can do everything he wants to do. Six, who knows the future of every person? The answer is only God. And seven, did God know all about the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes. Eight, if people ignore God, will he bypass them and not punish them? No. See, God is interested in all people, and he's the judge of every person. Nine, why didn't God immediately punish the evil people of Sodom and Gomorrah? I mean, why doesn't God immediately punish sinners today? And the answer is because God is loving and merciful, gracious and patient. And he gives people time to change their minds and to trust in him. 10. Does God merely threaten but never punish sinners? No. Even though God is patient, he will eventually Even though God is patient, he will eventually punish sinners. 11. Can anyone stop God from punishing people when he decides that they've had sufficient time to repent or change their minds? The answer is no. God is supreme and there's no one greater than him. 12. Why did the Lord and his angels uh, to, 12. Why did the Lord send his angels to rescue Lot, his wife, and family? It's because Lot agreed with God that he was a sinner, and he trusted in God's promises to send the deliverer. And 13. Why did God turn Lot's wife into a pillar of salt? It's because she disobeyed the command of the Lord when he told them not to look back at the burning cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, now let's continue on looking at A, introduction, trying to help God keep his promise. And in our last lesson, we read that Abraham believed God and that God credited Abraham's faith to him as righteousness. Today, we're going to study the greatest, of A, greatest test of Abraham's faith. But more important than Abraham's faith is the faithful God in whom he trusted. Now, Sarah was the wife of Abraham and Hagar was her servant. And God had promised Abraham many descendants. But now, it's ten years after the promise, and Sarah still can't have any children. And they're both on the verge of becoming too old to have any children whatsoever. They're also becoming really impatient in waiting for God's promise to come to pass. So what do they try to do? They try to help God out. And isn't that what we do so often? We feel like God's not going to come through. He's not going to make good on his promises to us. So we try to help him out as though God needs our help. So Sarah chose to give her servant Hagar to Abraham. 
in accordance with the custom of the day, so that Sarah could have a child through her. Basically, Hagar became her surrogate. All right? In Genesis 16, verse 2, we read, So Sarah said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Why don't you sleep with my slave? Maybe I can build a family through her. And Abraham agreed with Sarah. B, the God who hears. Hagar conceived and bore Abraham a son named Ishmael. But before this happens, seeing Hagar pregnant, Sarah begins to deal harshly with her because she resents Hagar's ability to have a child. Also, who knows, maybe at this time, Hagar was flaunting and bragging about her ability to please Abraham and Sarah's inability to do so in terms of becoming pregnant. So it finally gets so bad, and there's so much conflict between Hagar and Sarah that Hagar runs away, and she flees to the desert to escape the resentment and the mistreatment of Sarah, her mistress. And it's while she's in the desert that Hagar met the messenger, or the angel of the Lord, as she was resting by a spring in the desert. And it's at this moment that she is despairing of life itself. I mean, she's ready to throw in the towel. She's ready, most likely, to commit suicide and just end it all. And we read in Genesis 16, verse 9, The messenger of the Lord said to her, Go back to your owner and place yourself under her authority. The messenger of the Lord also said to her, I will give you many descendants, and no one will be able to count them because there will be so many. Then the messenger of the Lord said to her, You are pregnant, and you'll give birth to a son, and you'll name him Ishmael, which means God hears, because the Lord has heard your cry of distress. He'll be as free and wild as an untamed donkey. He will fight with everyone, and everyone will fight with him. And he's going to have conflicts with all of his relatives. So Hagar named the Lord, who had been speaking to her, You are the God who watches over me. And she said, this is the place where I watch the one who watches over me. And I think it's so significant that Hagar knew it was the Lord who was speaking to her and named him the God who watches over me. And the Hebrew is el Rohai, And isn't that an awesome name for God, the one who watches over me and you? You see, God watches over those who are his children. For me, this is really comforting. God knows me. He knows what I'm going through at this very moment. And Hagar was despairing of life itself and ready to end it all. And then the Lord shows up and he tells her that he understands and he cares for her and he knows exactly what she's going through. And for me, that's so encouraging. You see, God sees and knows you and me and he knows everything that's going on in our lives. Ask el Rolahi, the God who sees you, to open your eyes to his work and to increase your faith, even and especially when his promises seem impossible to fulfill, all right? Because he is the God who does the impossible. He delights in doing the impossible. He's the God who can do the things that you and I can't do. My wife always has a saying, she says, uh, make it easy on yourself and make it hard on God. You know, God can do the impossible. So the angel of the Lord relayed the promise from God, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the Lord tells Hagar to name her son Ishmael, which means God hears. The Lord goes on to say that Ishmael will fight with everyone. He's going to have conflicts with his relatives. And we're witnessing, we're witnessing that at this very time. The Arab people, those who are of the religion of Israel. Oh, gosh. The Arab people, those who are of the religion of Islam, they are the sons of Ishmael. And there is a constant struggle between Islam and the Jews as well as Christians. In fact, Islam believes that the child of promise is Ishmael and not Isaac. And now we turn our attention back to Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 18. We look here at C. God fulfilled his promise and gave Abraham and Sarah a son. Let's read Genesis 18 verse 11. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time. And Sarah was long past the age of having children. And so she laughed silently to herself and said, How could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also so old? And Psalm 115, verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens, and he does as he wishes. And Jeremiah 32, 17 says, O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. 
Let me repeat that. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. In Acts 17.26, From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. And 1 Chronicles 29 verse 11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, and you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion people are made great and given strength. Psalm 24 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. You see, God is the central focus of this story and of the whole Bible. The Bible is God's story. And the theme here is that God is all-powerful. Now, why won't God settle for anything less than the path of impossibility? And the reason is that God wants to show that nothing is too difficult for the Lord. That includes everything going on in your life right now. There's nothing that you're facing that's too difficult for God. Now, why is the promise to Abraham so relevant? Well, the importance of the promise to Abraham is massively relevant to all believers in the Bible. Consider these points. This promise to Abraham is described by Paul as actually being the gospel. He says in Galatians 3, verse 8, What's more, the scriptures look forward to this time when God would declare the Gentiles to be righteous because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, that all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. And then the Apostle Paul, when in prison for preaching the gospel, claimed that it was because of his hope in the promises to the fathers of Israel, namely Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he was being condemned. In Ephesians 2.12 we read, In those days you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. You see, one of the reasons for Jesus Christ's work was to fulfill and confirm this promise to Abraham. We read in Romans 15, verse 8, that remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. And what was the promise that God made to Abraham? Well, the details of the promise to Abraham unfolded gradually throughout his life. Abraham's faithful obedience was rewarded by further details being revealed to him. Here is an outline of the promise and its different aspects. The initial promise was given at Ur of Chaldees. We read about that in Genesis 12, verse 2 through 3. Then God tells Abraham that Abraham would become a great nation and be a, have a great name. And then God tells him that God would bless those who blessed him and curse those who cursed him. So in other words, if you blessed Abraham, God said those people would be blessed. And if they cursed Abraham or Abraham's descendants, then they would be cursed. And then God promises that in Abraham, eventually all nations will be blessed. And after entering the land God was to show him, Abraham was then given the following promise at Shechem. And we read this in Genesis 12, verse 7, that Abraham would have children seed who would inherit the land, and that's the land that we now call Israel. After an example of Abraham's unselfish attitude where Abraham gave his nephew Lot first choice over the land where he could go and graze his cattle on, these further revelations occur at Bethel in Genesis 13. Abraham and his seed would inherit the land of Israel forever, and his seed would be multitudinous. When Abraham showed that he believed in God in Genesis 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham by sacrifice. And the boundaries of the land which God would give to Abraham and his seed were clearly defined in this covenant. And part of these boundaries include the present-day Israel, which was given to Abraham and his seed, the Israelites, or today's Jews, by God himself. You see, Israel, Israel does not belong to the Palestinians or any other people group. It was given by God to his chosen people, the Jews. Now, what does the promise to Abraham mean? Well, the seed of Abraham, we read in Galatians 3.16, God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. And then notice that the scripture doesn't say to his children, as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child. And that, of course, means Christ. 
the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And that's found in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The verses here on the screen show the importance and meaning of the promised Abraham. Jesus Christ is the promised seed. The land of Israel was promised to Abraham and to his seed, Jesus Christ. How can others share in this promise? Galatians 3.26 says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And goes on to say, And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on the character of Christ like putting on new clothes. And verse 28, There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And 29, And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. So you see that a belief or a faith in Jesus Christ and an understanding of these promises enables us to be heirs of the promise to Abraham. And as Peter puts it in 2 Peter chapter 1, he writes, And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. And these are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and to escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. The Bible teaches that by belief and baptism, a person is considered as being in Christ. And when you're in Christ, which basically in turn is Abraham's seed, the promise from God, that is, in thy seed shall all nations be blessed. Abraham's seed then was firstly a singular aspect, Christ, but is also a multitude aspect, believers, and the promises through Christ, who are as the sand and stars for a multitude. Now D, Abraham's visit with three heavenly strangers. We pick up today's lesson in Genesis 18, where Abraham has an encounter with three heavenly visitors. We read in Genesis 18, starting in verse 1, The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. One day Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent during the hottest part of the day. He looked up and noticed three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them, and he welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. Rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on with your journey. All right, they said, do as you said. So Abraham ran back to the tent and he said to Sarah, Hurry, get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough, and bake some bread. And then Abraham ran out to the herd and chose a tender calf. He gave it to a servant who quickly prepared it. And when the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk and the roasted meat, and he served it to the men. And as they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the trees. Where is Sarah, your wife? the visitors asked. Well, she's inside the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Now Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. And Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time. And Sarah was long past the age of having children. And so she laughed silently to herself, and she said, how could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such a pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, he's so old? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why does Sarah laugh? I mean, why did she say, Can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, Oh, no, you did laugh. You see, by this time, Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah is about 90 years old. And Sarah laughed when God said that she would have a child. See, Sarah had never had a child, and she knew that it was nat naturally it was impossible at her age for her to have a child. But you see, nothing is impossible with God. He can do anything that he wants to do. And the theme here is that God is faithful and he never changes. See, many years had passed since God first promised to give Abraham a son. But God had not forgotten his promise. He had not changed his mind. Sarah had a son just as God had promised. Abraham and Sarah called their son Isaac. And reading in Genesis 21 verse 1, The Lord kept his word and he did for Sarah exactly what he promised. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. And Abraham named his son Isaac. And you can see Isaac here on the chronological chart. Okay? In other words, everyone we're talking about is firmly rooted in history. 
I mean, these are not people or, or uh, persons that were made up and fabricated, but they are historical figures. Here Isaac appears on a chronological chart at uh, this point in time. The theme here is God is supreme and sovereign. See, God could decide to give Abraham and Sarah a son because he's the creator of all people and all things. You see, it's God who gives life to all people everywhere. He gave life to our ancestors. He gave life to each of us and to our children. See, this world and everyone and everything in it belongs to God. Abraham and Sarah belong to God, and their son Isaac belonged to God. Now, with the birth of Isaac, the rivalry between Hagar and Sarah soon rears its ugly head, and it manifests itself at Isaac's weaning party. You see, in many cultures, people celebrate the ending or cessation of breastfeeding. Kind of like the celebration that goes on in homes where a child no longer needs to be in diapers, and that's one less expense in your budget every week. So during the celebration, however, something goes wrong. Although the exact nature of the offense is really unclear, Isaac did something, uh, Ishmael did something toward Isaac that upsets Sarah enough that she asks Abraham to send Hagar and her son away, never to return. Yet Ishmael isn't just Hagar's son, he's Abraham's son. And as Abraham's son, Abraham doesn't want to see him go. And while contemplating what to do, God appears to Abraham and assures him that Ishmael and Hagar will be okay, and that Ishmael's descendants will someday be a great nation. So with this assurance, Abraham says farewell to Hagar and his beloved son Ishmael. Now this isn't the last that we see of Ishmael or his descendants who are called Ishmaelites, Later in the Bible, when Abram dies, Ishmael returns to help Isaac bury their father. And now we come to E. God commands Abram to offer up Isaac. The theme here is that God communicates with man. See, many years passed and Isaac grew to be a young man. His father and mother loved him. And Abram believed that all of God's promises concerning the coming deliverer were to be fulfilled through Isaac and his descendants. But one day God told Abram to do a most unexpected and difficult thing. And the theme here is that God is supreme and sovereign. We read in Genesis 22, verse 1, Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied. Here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Now God was testing Abraham to see if he loved Isaac more than he loved God. And now you might ask, why would Abraham bargain over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah and not bargain over the fate of his own son Isaac? Now the text doesn't say, it doesn't really give us any clue, but many scholars feel that it was precisely because of Abraham's experience with Sodom and Gomorrah that makes it unnecessary for him to bargain with God here. See, Abraham knows that no matter what God does, he does it for a reason. And so Abraham silently obeys. Now, the question is, what authority did God have to tell Abraham to take Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice? Well, think about this. Does your neighbor or anyone else have the right to tell you what to do with your children, your house, your car, or your possessions? No. Why not? Because they're yours. They belong to you. They don't belong to your neighbor. But didn't Isaac belong to Abraham? Wasn't Isaac Abraham's son? And didn't Abraham have authority over Isaac? Well, Isaac was Abraham's son, but who gave Isaac his life? Who gave Isaac to Abraham and Sarah? God did. Isaac belonged to God, and God's the one who miraculously enabled Abraham and Sarah to have Isaac as their son, the child. And God gives life to every person and every living thing. And God creates everything. Therefore, God has authority over all people and all things. And now we come to F, Abraham believed God. The theme here is man must have faith in order to please God and be saved. Now I want you to think about what was happening. What a surprise this must have been to Abraham. I mean, what an impossibly difficult test. Had God changed his mind about Isaac and his promises? How could God's promises be fulfilled through Isaac if Abraham killed him? Had God changed his mind? Had God decided that the Deliverer would not be one of Isaac's descendants? Now, how did Abraham respond? You see, even though Abraham was told to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, 
He did not doubt or question God. He accepted what God had said. How could he respond like this? Well, I believe it's because he knew and he believed God. He knew that God would not lie. And he knew that God would not give him the promises and then change his mind. And he trusted God and he believed that God would still keep his word. Now, wasn't this an impossible thing for a man to do? I mean, Abraham was a man just like you or I. And this test of his faith was terribly difficult. We might say pretty much impossible. But you see, Abraham had put his full trust in God. He had come to realize that God never fails. And I want you to think about this. It's hard for us to imagine one who never fails to keep his word. You see, our intentions are often really good, very good, but we just don't follow through. We get busy or tired or distracted, and we fail to do the things that we promised to do. And we read in Hebrews 11, verse 17, that it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants shall be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Now, God is not like us. Abraham discovered just what each person needs to discover for himself, that God never fails to do the things that he's promised to do, that you and I, that we can fully trust him. You see, this is what God wants us to do. He wants you and I to believe in him and to trust him. Hebrews 11:19 says that Abraham believed Abraham believed that even if he did kill Isaac in obedience to God, that God would raise Isaac from the dead. See, he knew it was impossible for man, but he trusted that God could do this. I want you to think about this. Abraham was different from Adam and Eve. You see, when they were in the garden, God had told Adam not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that if he did so, that day that he did so, he would surely die. But when Satan told Eve that they wouldn't die, Adam and Eve believed Satan. They doubted the word of God, and they disobeyed God. Adam and Eve did not believe God. But you see, Abraham did. He believed that God would keep his word. Because Abraham believed and trusted in God, he immediately made preparations to go to the place where God had promised to lead him. And we read in Genesis 22, starting verse 3, The next morning Abraham got up early, he saddled his donkey, and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. And then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering, and he set out for the place that God had told him about. And on the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place off in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. Now we come to G. Isaac questions and Abraham answers. And the theme here is, man must have faith in order to please God. We read in Genesis 22, verse 6, So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Now I want you to consider Isaac's situation. He had undoubtedly witnessed many sacrifices. He could not understand why they had not taken a sheep with them to the sacrifice. And Abraham had not told Isaac what God had told him to do. We read in Genesis 22, verse 8, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and they walked on together. So you see, Abraham trusted God. Believing God is the most important thing that we can do. See, just listening to a sermon or even hearing or reading the words of the Bible, it won't deliver us from the control of Satan. We must accept God's words and trust in him. And we need to take God's words and put them into practice. We need to be doers of the word of God. I want you to think about this. If you were sick and you went to the doctor and he prescribed medicine, would it be of any benefit to you if, he only told you about the medicine and how it could heal you? I mean, would just listening to the doctor tell you about the medicine heal you? Of course not. You see, only listening to God's words is not going to help us. If we only listen but refuse to believe, if we only listen but refuse to put God's words into practice, then we're doing what Satan did when he spoke to Eve. We're calling God a liar. You see, God will never accept those who refuse to believe him. 
God accepts those who, like Abraham, believe all that he says and trust only in him and put his words into practice. In other words, they become doers of the word. We come to H here, Abraham bound Isaac. The theme here is man is a sinner, he needs God, and he's helpless to save himself. The theme also is that God is holy and righteous. He demands death as a payment for sin. We read in Genesis 22, starting at verse 9, When they came to the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar and arranged the wood on it. And then he tied up his son Isaac and laid him on top of the wood on the altar. Next, Abraham picked up the knife. He took it in his hand to sacrifice his son. See, at this point, there was no escape for Isaac. He was bound and he was laid on the altar. And Abraham lifted up his knife to kill him. And God had commanded Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And there was no way for Isaac to escape once he was on the altar. Think about this. It's the same when God shut the door of the ark after Noah and his family and all the animals and birds were safe inside. And there was no escape for the people outside the ark who did, who did not believe God. And they were shut out. And there is no escape for the people of the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah when God sent down fire on them. There is no escape for Lot's wife when she disobeyed God and looked back at the city of Sodom. You see, God saved Noah and his family from the flood, and God saved Lot and his daughters from the fire which destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And only God could save Isaac from being killed. Now, is there any way that we can save ourselves from death and everlasting punishment for our sins? No. We cannot save ourselves. You see, God's going to punish all sin, and no one can escape from God. God and only God can make a way of escape. So do you know what God did? Well, let's continue our study, and we're going to find out, all right? We come to I. God provided a ram to take Isaac's place. The theme here is that God communicates with man. The theme here also is that God is loving, merciful, and gracious. We read in Genesis 22, starting verse 10, Next, Abraham picked up the knife and took it in his hand to sacrifice his son. But the messenger of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, he answered. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you did not refuse to give me your son, your only son. So God saved Isaac, and God told Abraham not to kill his son. Isaac couldn't be saved, however, unless there was another suitable sacrifice to offer up to God. Abraham and Isaac didn't have a suitable sacrifice with them. But you see, God provided another offering instead of Isaac. Abraham could not provide the sacrifice. God graciously provided a ram instead of Isaac. We read in Genesis 22:13, When Abraham looked around, he saw a ram behind him caught by its horns in a bush. So Abraham took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. We read in Galatians 3, starting at verse 6, Abraham serves as, as an example. He believed God, and that faith was regarded by God to be his approval of Abraham. You must understand that people who have faith are Abraham's descendants. Scripture saw ahead of time that God would give his approval to non-Jewish people who have faith. So Scripture announced the good news to Abraham ahead of time when it said that, Through you, all people of the world will be blessed. So people who believe are blessed together with Abraham, the man of faith. And I want you to look at this picture here, Abraham offering up Isaac. The theme here is that God is holy and righteous. He demands death as the payment for sin. The theme also is that man can come to God only according to God's will and plan. You see, God caused the ram to be caught by its horns in the bush. Now, if it had been caught by any other part of its body, it would have been injured in, in struggling and trying to get free. And if it had been injured, then it would not be an acceptable offering to God. See, God would only accept a healthy, strong animal as a sacrifice. Because God is perfect, he will only accept what is perfect. God provided an acceptable sacrifice in place of Isaac. And the theme here is that God is faithful, he never changes. See, God is faithful, he kept his promise to Abraham. And through Isaac, God would give Abraham many descendants. So Abraham took Isaac off the altar he put the ram which God had provided on the altar so it could be killed instead of Isaac. Abraham killed the ram and he burned it as a sacrifice unto the Lord. And the ram died instead of Isaac. And the ram was his substitute. And God saved Isaac by providing the ram to die in his place. And we come to J. Abraham trusted God to send the deliverer. 
And the theme here is that man must have faith in order to please God and be saved. We read in Genesis 23, starting verse 14, Abraham named the place, The Lord Will Provide. And it is still said today that on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. And then the messenger of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I am taking an oath on my own name, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, have not refused to give me your son, your only son, I will certainly bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the grains of sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of their enemies' cities. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and together they left for Beersheba. And Abraham remained in Beersheba. And Abraham called the place where God provided the ram, the Lord will provide. So you see, God provided a ram to die instead of Isaac. And Abraham believed that God would also provide the deliverer to rescue mankind from the power of Satan and from the punishment of sin. And now we come to K, the conclusion. So, why did God ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? After all, if this was simply a test of Abraham's faith, why didn't God ask Abraham to jump off a cliff, or slide down the pyramids, or even sacrifice himself? See, while many proposals have been put forth, the ultimate reason God would ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac is that Isaac, more than anything or anyone else, embodies God's promises to Abraham. You see, without Isaac, there is no heir, no nation, no promises, and no blessings. By asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, God is asking Abraham to demonstrate his complete trust in him for his future. Abraham demonstrates his complete trust, and for this, he not only receives God's promises, but he also receives the good life. See, from the Bible's perspective, one cannot truly achieve the good life without living a good life. That is, by doing what's right, trusting God and loving others. See, one may make it to the top of the heap, but being the top dog is no value if the heap is nothing more than broken promises, broken relationships, and broken commandments. Abram has undergone some serious character development, and it shows that he has a heart for God, and that Abraham trusts God with his life and his future. With Isaac spared and an acceptable sacrifice provided in place of Isaac, the line of the promised deliverer, or the Messiah, was preserved. As Abraham discovered, God can be trusted to fulfill his promises, and God is worthy of our trust. And now let's do some uh, review here. Here's some questions to see if you got a really good handle on what we've been talking about today. Question number one. Why was God able to give Abraham and Sarah a son, even though he's 100 years old and she was 90? The answer is because God gives life to all people everywhere. And B, God is omnipotent, and he can do anything he wants to do. Two, what authority did God have to ask Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice? It's because God is the creator of all things, and therefore he's the owner of all things, and God gave life to Isaac. And three, did Abraham think that God had changed his mind about Isaac, being the father of the great nation and the forefather of the deliverer? No, Abraham believed and trusted in God because he was convinced that God always keeps his promises. And four, what did Abraham think God might do? Well, Abraham thought that if he did kill Isaac, as God had commanded him to, that God would raise Isaac from the dead. Five, once Abraham had bound and put Isaac on the altar, was there any way Isaac could deliver himself from death? No, Isaac could not deliver himself from death. Six, is there any way a person can save himself from the payment of death and everlasting punishment which he deserves because of his sins? And the answer is no. No one can save himself or herself from the punishment of God. No one can escape from God. 7. Who spoke to Abraham and saved Isaac from death? The answer is God did. And 8. Was there anyone else who could have saved Isaac from death except God? No. And 9. Who provided a sacrifice to take Isaac's place? God did. And ten. And why was the ram held in the bush by its horns? It's because God is perfect, and he would only accept an offering if it was strong and healthy. And finally, question eleven. Why did Abraham call the place where God provided the ram, the Lord will provide? Because Abraham believed that just as the Lord provided the ram instead of Isaac, 
the Lord would one day provide the deliverer who would overcome Satan and deliver mankind from Satan's power and everlasting punishment. Well, that's it for today's lesson. And next week, we're on Lesson 19, which is Isaac's sons, Jacob and Esau, becoming two nations. And that's going to be next week's lesson. It's going to be real exciting. I hope you'll be here to join me for this uh, upcoming lesson. And as always, you can go to our website, the address right here on the screen, foundationstudy.weebly.com, and you can view all of our past lessons on video. You can also download notes for each lesson and print them out and follow along. All right? And send your family and friends to our website so they too can be a part of what we're doing here. And I hope you're really uh, enjoying this time together, that you're learning a lot, and that you're getting to know God better. And uh, your faith and trust in God is growing every week as we do this Firm Foundation series. Until next week, this is Pastor Dale saying, uh, may you have a blessed week. May the, may the shalom, peace of God be upon you and your family. Until next week, bye.